Welcome to Brown Library. This is a, a wonderful evening. We're going to sort of talk about Essex folks, both knowable and, and nuts, as I said, um, in honor of a man who knew a lot of very notable and, and wonderful people here in Essex and probably wished he could be here to tell some stories. We, we're honoring Lawrence Stendhal Jr., who uh, was the uh, on the chair of the uh, board of the trustees here at Essex Junction from, you said, 1988 till last year when he passed away. So we are really, we're really pleased that we could gather you together to tell stories about folks in Essex because of the, he loved the, the, the village and it wasn't the building so much as the people. And uh, so, and, and the library um, had a, a wonderful history with uh, the Brownell family across the street and, and, uh, and the story that strikes me the most this evening, we'll get a copy, the only stand fresh copy of Mary Brownell's Mellow Memories, because she was an eccentric and, uh, and interesting, and uh, her memories are, go back to the 19th century. So it's sort of an incentive to tell her tale, and you'll get the Mary Brownell's book. So uh, without uh, further ado, I guess I want to uh, recognize Annie. I don't, do you have any, any, anything you want to say to the crowd, or should we start with the stories, Ann? Just start with the stories. Excellent. Um, thank you for coming, all of you. Uh, first off, I'd like Tim German to come up and uh, tell about whomever he wishes to talk about. Tim. Thank you. Well, I'm Tim German, and I did serve with uh, Larry for seven years on the trustees. I actually took his seat when he ran for president. And I wanted to just tell a real brief story about Larry that he told me, must, if he told me it once, it was probably four times. Uh, last year, another great Essex gentleman died named Alden Walcott. And Alden lived up on Rivendell Lane. And Alden was Larry's chemistry teacher in high school. And Larry told this story, and he never forgot it, and he kept repeating it, but apparently, he hadn't decided if he was going to go to college, and he hadn't decided to take chemistry, which he would have needed to go to college at UVM. And he started Alden Walcott's class about six weeks late. And I guess Mr. Walcott pulled him aside after the first one and said, "We don't think you're, I don't think you're going to make it, and maybe you shouldn't be uh, taking chemistry." Well, that. All he needed to tell Larry, and uh, I think for the rest of his life he remembered. And he would tell that story with his famous phrase, Well, Mr. Man, didn't I uh, get my back up on that and buckle down? But he never forgot Alden Walcott. He loved the man and credited him in many ways with uh, going on and becoming successful and challenging him to do that. So I always remember that. It was a wonderful story. Uh, the other story I want to tell tonight it's always fascinated me the first time I heard it, and it's, um, it happened in the 1880s, so that the people really are long gone. Um, as you all know, we were a railhead, uh, and we had a line going out all the way to Cambridge from Burlington, so you could not only take the trolley here, but you could take the train. And in about 1885, uh, a relatively famous person who's relatively forgotten today, his name was Edward J. Phelps, and he lived in Burlington, he was a famous attorney, and he came to Essex Junction, and he was trying to take the train to Boston, but he sat around for eight or nine hours, and then he thought he was getting on the Boston train, and he got right back on the train that he came on, and was headed back to Burlington, and he was so incensed that he wrote a poem, which really aggravated everybody in Essex Junction <laughs> for a very long time. It was called The Lay of the Lost Traveler, and before I read it, and the response to it from the Essex Postmaster, uh, I did some research on Phelps, and he would be a real common name. He'd be as common as um, Justin Morrill or uh, George Aiken, if indeed he had not missed his one great opportunity, which was he had served as a minister of Chile in the Fillmore administration, and then he became, when a Democrat, he was a Democrat, and a Democrat finally got elected uh, Grover Cleveland in the 1880s, and he was appointed minister of England, and he did a wonderful job. They loved him in England. and. He was then, there was an opening to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he would have been the first Vermonter. His name um, was put in, and President Cleveland wanted to appoint him, but right before that happened, he heard from his Democratic constituents in Boston, who, was ma who were mainly Irish, and word had gotten back that Phelps, when he was Minister of England, had been too cozy with the English and hadn't stood up for the Irish rights. So politically, 
that was the end of him as far as that um, job right there. But he did go on. Um, he was respected by everybody. I found there's a picture of him in, this is the book about the Bennington Monument. In 1891, he led and then gave the main address for the Centennial exhibit exhibition, which was the largest gathering in Vermont ever at that time of um, something like 20 or 30,000 people in Bennington to unveil the monument. President Harrison was there and spoke very highly of um, Phelps, as, as well as did all the other people. And it was, it was a very great, um, it's actually a very good speech. If anybody wants to read it, I'd recommend it. The problem that he had when he was, as a Democrat, which there were very few of back then, during the Civil War, he had been a Copperhead um, Democrat, which means he was, he was against the war and wanted a negotiated peace. And he was, I don't know how else to say that, he was pretty virulently racist and had said some things in Burlington at some meetings, which came back to haunt him years later. He also ran for governor, and they threw that back in his face. He had made some really extremely racist comments and really negative comments about President Lincoln. So. Around 1880 and 1890s, when he was in the prime of his career, that, that wasn't a way to get ahead in Vermont <laughs> politics, was to be dissing all everybody who was elected governor who was a Civil War veteran by then. So, but he's an interesting man. Anyway, but I thought the poem was kind of funny. Um, and I, after I read it, I'll give you Alan Martin, who most of you know. Was, Essex's main attorney for many, many years, and our town clerk, and he had some very pointed comments about Mr. Phelps as well. Uh, the Lay of the Lost Traveler. With saddened face and battered hat, an eye that told of black despair, on wooden bench the traveler sat, cursing the fate that brought him there. Nine hours, he cried, we've lingered here, with thought intent on distant homes, waiting for the elusive train, which always coming, never comes. Till weary, worn, distressed, forlorn, and paralyzed in every function. I hope in hell their souls may dwell, who first invented Essex Junction. I've traveled east, I've traveled west, over mountains, valley, plain, and river, midst whirlwinds, wrath, and tempest blast, through railroads crash and steamboats shiver, and faith and courage faltered not, nor strength gave way, nor hope was shaken, until I reached this dismal spot of man accursed, of God forsaken, where strange new forms of misery assail men's souls without compunction, and I hope in hell his soul may dwell, who first invented Essex Junction. Here Boston waits for Ogden, Ogdensburg, and Ogdensburg for Montreal, and late New York tarrieth, and Saratoga hindereth all, from far Atlantic's wave-swept bays to Mississippi's turbid tide. All accidents, mishap, delays are gathered here and multiplied. O oh, fellow men, avoid this stop, as you would plague or Peter Fink shun. And I hope in hell his soul may dwell who first invented Essex Junction. And long and late conductors tell of trains delayed or late or slow, till e'en the engine's bell takes up the cry, no go, no go. Oh, let me from this hole depart by any route, so be it a lone one. He cried with madness in his heart and jumped aboard a train, the wrong one. And as he vanished in the smoke, he shouted with redoubled unction, and I hope in hell his soul may dwell who first invented Essex Junction. Now, shortly after that, and I think it was about 10 or 15 years after that, because I think it was right after uh, Phelps died in the early 1890s, Alfred Lonergan, who was the postmaster at Essex, put in this rejoinder. Some years ago, a senator, I believe Phelps was his name, and I'll just stop there, because the senator was Phelps' father. He was Samuel Phelps who was also very well known and served with Daniel Webster and the great giants of the early days of the Senate in the 1820s and 30s. I believe Phelps was his name, sojourned in Essex Junction while waiting for a train, inclined to be poetic to pass the time away, in rhyme real pathetic, had quite a lot to say, condemning Essex Junction in English not so swell. In fact, he hoped its founders were shoveling coal in hell. The writer has sojourned here nigh on to 30 years, to diagnose, the senator had brains with wheels and gears that needs oiling quite badly to open up his eyes, to find he's erred quite sadly and should apologize. The writer feels the junction is a pleasant place to live, its people and its founders the best that God could give. A haven that was founded in our Green Mountain State, 
by pioneers that rounded among the good and great. Those pioneers have come and gone. I've stood beside their heirs. They seem to whisper, carry on, waste not your time in tears. Somehow in kin they left behind, the spirit seems to last. The mill will never grind with water that is past. The trees will cease to bloom and flower unless you give them sap. The mighty streams will lose their power unless you fill the gap. Their names engraved on monuments, their pens have ceased to function, but they have written history for good old Essex Junction. Their pens were swords at Gettysburg, also at Valley Forge. Their inks were drops of human blood that flowed down from the gorge, that followed good old Sherman from Atlanta to the sea, that made the good old USA a land of liberty. The CB station stands erect where sat the famous Phelps to criticize these gallant men between the groans and yelps. Because the gears were all gummed up that God put in his brains and clogged the art of reason when it came to catching trains. He couldn't tell if Montreal was way down south or north. He didn't know if Santa Claus came around on July 4th. And so he boarded the wrong train and had to hike it back. In other words, our famous Phelps was clean way off his track. With saddened face and battered hat, on a wooden bench the poet sat, trying to clear his muddled brains all mixed up on CV trains. With mighty pen, without compunction, assailed the village of Essex Junction. His poem sojourns as an aftermath, and these words are written in epitaph. Here lies a poet whose muddled brain sent him to hell on a CV train. <laughs> Since he has passed the great divide, his mistakes and delays have multiplied. His mighty pen has ceased to function. He shovels coal for lack of gumption. Nor hide nor hair can he find there who first invented this junction. Yay! <laughs> the last thing, Alan Martin, who I think was kind of a crusty guy, he wrote this history in 1942, and it's down there. People from the village had asked him to put down his thoughts, and he was talking about the railroad, and then he said, this was probably the background for E.J. Phelps' so-called poem. I'm not going to read it. It has been quoted until it is threadbare. I was never enthusiastic over that piece of literature. It was written by a man who did not know how to travel. It is not classical. It is not verse. It has no humor. It has no music. It cannot even be followed on the piano. I think all these poems were better. There was actually two others that I've seen. I'm not going to read tonight. There were two other replies that were equally funny. So in its time, this was uh, quite the big deal. Thank you, Tim. I have a little list. Um, let's see, Sheila, you're second. This is Sheila Porter, and she's a library trustee and a well-known kindergarten or a child care provider for her many chickens. And I'm here to talk to you about Mrs. Frances Frost, who was a kindergarten mm -hmm. teacher out of her home in Essex Junction. And I brought a picture in case anybody wanted to see what she looked like. And there is a picture of her in the album, the big blue album there too. Oh yeah. Um, there's actually a book fund here at the library that was started by her granddaughter um, when she turned 90 so that books could be purchased in her honor um, because that was what she wanted to instill in children, the love of reading. And she started that um, for them. She was a retired teacher and opened the kindergarten in her house, which was right behind my grandparents' house. So I got to know her very well. Um, she was already old when I met her. She was 75 when I was born. So I only knew her as an old, little, tiny old woman. Um, but she had a better memory than anybody I've ever met in my entire life. She remembered everybody that she knew. She remembered her students. She remembered their children. She remembered their grandchildren. She knew everyone's name. And anytime she saw you, she would always ask about the rest of your family. Um, <clears throat> she, m when my sister and I were little, <coughs> my mom taught us to cross stitch. And um, Mrs. Frost loved owls, so we cross stitched little tiny owls for her. And every time we went to her house, she showed us where the owls were. When she moved into um, a duplex, because they, her children didn't think she should live on her own anymore, she put the owls still in a prominent place and made sure to show me where they were. Um, 
she she is the reason that I do what I do. I have a child care out of my house, which I've had for now 23 years. Um, Mrs. Frost taught kindergarten for 23 years, not just 20, because my youngest aunt was born and my grandparents begged her to please continue until my Aunt Pam had a chance to go through kindergarten in her house also. Um, she was a very special woman and anybody who knew her would tell you the same thing. I'm honored that I knew her and um, I wish that all of you had the chance to know her. I, did any of you here know Mrs. Frost? Okay, great. <laughs> so I'm glad that most of you knew her also. Um, and I like to tell people about her because I think she was a really important part of Essex Junction for a long time. I once asked her what, she, what advice, and she was 100, and I said, well, what's the advice you'd have? She goes, I don't think war is a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something no. she would say. No. No. She, she lived across the street from me, and when she was 96, she came to a party and there was all these people. And, Dr. Keenan's son, David, came mm -hmm. up to her and she says, oh, David, I had you in second grade. Then she went out for the next 10 minutes to tell him everything that he did 40 years ago. <laughs> I get in trouble. That, that's right. the kind of memory she had. Yeah. She remembers when the library was over at the fire station, which is about where um, the, the video store used to be mm -hmm. across from Martones. Mm -hmm. She remembered that that was the library she remembered, which was yeah. before. She was amazing. Yeah, she really was. We had a party for her. A Night of a Thousand Stars, mm -hmm. and many people, um, fam famous and, and well-known folks in the junction, read from their favorite book in honor of her, and it was a, a wonderful, it was a very memorable evening. I think there are pictures of mm -hmm. her in that album. She was and, born and in the house on the corner of East and Pleasant Street, which mm -hmm. was the only house there at the time. Yeah. <laughs> that tells you how long she lived in the junction. I, I went to kindergarten with her. Did you also? Did you go to kindergarten? No. Did anybody else have her as a kindergarten teacher? You had her for a kindergarten Both teacher. Both I and my sister had her. Mm -hmm. She was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten. That's true. Right? That's <laughs> very <laughs> true. <laughs> very <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, all. Sheila. Thank you. Oh, thank you for bringing back her wonderful memory. I'm going to ask Mary the Marcus to come up. Okay. <clears throat> Get it over with. Good. Yes. Uh, anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about my grandfather, Judson Horatio Hilliker, and his wife Daisy. I call him a man of gun, guts, and garrulous. He had a great personality, he spun a fantastic yarn. He was ancestor to the first white settler in the town of Swanton. We always said he was a Hessian soldier, but found it out that he was a buddy Tory. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, he had a, he grew up as an orphan, father was a drunk, and he came to, first of all, he went out to, um, to um, Detroit to work in a munitions factory. And he found out that he had a tremendous mechanical ability. And they wanted him to stay. But one day he went out to lunch, and it, the whole factory blew up behind him. <gasps> So he decided he would go back to Vermont, where he loved it, and he was a terrific hunter, loved to fish every chance he got, and a well-known shot. He courted my grandmother, Daisy Chatham Killiker, who was definitely of the farming class, the gentry. And he didn't have a chance against the minister's son, who was also courting her. So one day, on a Sunday, he saw uh, this minister's son walking along the trestle in Swanton with his white spats on and with um, fancy pants. <laughs> so he hid underneath the trestle, took out his gun, and shot the mud. So it splattered up on the minister's son. <laughs> so he couldn't go see Daisy that day. <laughs> so Daisy, with the beautiful eyes, was wed to Judson Horacer Fenneker. At that point, Later on, they got a daughter, my mother, Natalie, and they decided he decided he needed to make a good living for her. So he came to Essex Junction, where the railroad had already created some prosperity, and decided to start a garage, a repair garage. He learned some things in the garage. Well, wait a minute, I've got to back up. First, he decided he was going to own the first 
car in Essex Junction. So he went down to Boston on the train, and he paid in cash, and he got them his Model T, and he sat in his Model T, and the guy said, would you like a few lessons, buddy? <laughs> and he said, no, no, I don't need any lessons. So he put the car in first gear and drove all the way to White River Junction. Well, the roads were rutted back then. So all of a sudden, in White River Junction, he hit a bump. And doggone, the car went into second gear. <gasps> and all the way from um, White River to Vermont, to Essex, the car went more smoothly, and the ride was definitely speedier. And this led him, with the help of Mr. Brownell, who introduced him around in Essex Junction, and maybe contributed financially, he started a, a garage on Pearl Street called Hilliker's Garage. Well, now we're going to fast forward to the Prohibition, okay? It's Prohibition time. Roadsters are coming down through Pearl Street at Great Clip with, what are they called again? Revenuers. Revenuers at their heel. And this was a common occurrence. And, you know, my grandfather was known for his mechanical ability. Well, one day he heard a roar, and the one of the cars <coughs> came roaring in, opened the, gar the garage or the uh, office door and said, um, hey buddy, can you take care of this roadster? And did a hasty retreat. Grandpa Judd said, quickly grab Dick Workman <laughs> and Daisy, his wife, and, and they all went out and took out all the booze from the bottom of the vehicle <laughs> and buried them under a tree. <laughs> A few days later, the Romaners came back. Now, you've got to picture this office here. My grandfather could lean back in his chair. His holster with his pistol was always right behind his head on the wall. And he always had his blue tip hound with him. In come the roadster, the, the Romaners. They checked over the vehicle and they said, Hey, buddy, there's something missing here, you know. And Grandpa leaned back towards his gun, <clears throat> and the blue tick hound got up and started to growl. And he backed out the door, and they said, well, I guess everything was all right here, and roared off down the <laughs> Anyway, he was a man who could capitalize on change, and that was one of the transition times that you had from the rail to the automobile. And anyway, um, let's see. My grandmother, who had beautiful eyes, as I said, was a Sunday school teacher and played the piano for people to sing at various parties. And I've decided that probably after they found all that booze, although she really was head of the Sunday school for many, many years, and supposedly a, a teetotaler, I do think one of those parties that she had back then, that they had, probably was as lively as anyone that was ever in Essex <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm going to ask Robert McEwen. Come on down. Come on down. Good. A package for us. Oh, well, it's, Somebody who this has to do with the library. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, good. This is a picture of my grandmother. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Is that the one that's in the room? We may want to have our camera. Yeah, same one. We may want our camera ladies to take a shot of that. Yeah. Well, I knew Larry pretty well because I lived just down the hill from him. And I went to the first grade up in Essex Center where the uh, library is located. Not the library, the uh, Historical Society building is located. Moved to Essex in time to enter the, the second grade which was in the Park Street, not the Park Street School, the Church Street School. Anyone know where that is? You know where it is. Church Street School. Come on, think oh, about where it. Where is that? Church Street School is the building behind the Congregational Church. Okay. Upstairs in the gym. Upstairs in the gym. That's yeah. where the second, I went to the yes. second grade. Then I went to the third grade school in the yeah. Prospect Street School, where everybody else went to, probably. Okay. It's here, mostly. So when was Park Street built? Park Street's old. Park Street was for the people on that side of the track. Church Street was for people on this side of the track. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, so I went there because I was on the side. Because you were on the other side of the track. Okay. There you go. 
Hmm? One of those people over there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, when I was, I don't know, fifth grade, sixth grade maybe, which is a long time ago. Back in fifth grade, I had Mrs. Chase for a teacher, maybe you remember her. Uh, one of the jobs that I had, because we all had jobs, you know, delivering papers or whatever, was emptying the waste baskets up here in the uh, extension service office, which is up on the second floor of Lincoln Hall. And I'd bring them down and I'd bring them out and I'd burn them in a burn barrel out behind here, which is a very acceptable thing to do at that time. That's how you get rid of your trash, you burn it. So I had that job and I also emptied the waste baskets in the library. I'd bring them back and I'd burn them in the burn barrel out in the back. I can't remember who the librarian was at that time. Well, no, the stone went on Probably. Yeah. Probably was. Yeah. Well, one day when I came to empty the waste baskets, probably Mrs. Stone said, would you get rid of these books for me? Oh. And I had these, <laughs> you notice I still have them. Yeah. She gave me these books to take out back and burn. Well, they were too big to burn, but the thing that bothered me about them was they were maps. I don't ever, ever burn maps because I've got maps in them. Anyhow, this happened to be an atlas, but it had, you know, torn spine. But it was an atlas of the United States, and it was an yeah. atlas of the world, right? In 1890 when they were. Yeah. But they were no good because, of course, the spine was broke. So my job was to burn it. Well, I couldn't burn it. So I took them home. I noticed there's a great map of Vermont in here. It shows the population of all the towns. Essex had a population in 1890, by the way, of 892 people. That was Essex, wow. Junction, and town combined. Uh, how, how old were you at this time? In 1890? <laughs> 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 no, no, no. When you were told to burn this? Well, I was about 10, 11 years old. So Which was a long time ago, by the way. <laughs> Let's put it this way, it was 60 plus years. How's that? <laughs> so I still have the book. And I don't know, library doesn't have any use for it, I'm sure, but oh, eventually I'll give it to something, maybe this. Well, let's open it up to the Vermont map. Well, I can do that. I'll oh, open could it up you? to the Vermont map here. You can take hold it up for our camera lady. Yeah, well, I won't hold it up. Oh, gently. I can help. I can Two hundred thirty-two is the page. Uh-huh. And here's Vermont. Here, let me help you. And uh, of course, in there it also shows the Oklahoma Territory and a few other things. The what? Oklahoma Territory. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. and, and Arizona wasn't a state. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this is Vermont back then. You can look through and get the population of your favorite town. It is Essex. It's in here also. How about Hinesburg? <laughs> That's probably. Right. Was that even a town? Yeah. No, no, probably. So that was the story about uh, the library. But going back to Larry, when we moved down to Essex, we lived up on Upper Main Street, just below the hill. And I used to go up on the farm, because they had an operating dairy farm up there. And I can't remember what they had for cows. They're probably Jerseys, but they did have them cows up there. And I remember one thing that Larry and I used to do when we, during milking, we'd go into the milk house. And of course, you poured the milk into a container and went into the five gallon cans that they had there. But there was always cream around the rim. <gasps> so you would sleep because why it tastes really good. <laughs> and that was one of the things that we periodically did when I was up on the farm uh, doing that. Okay, so we'll continue down from the farm and I can remember a situation that happens because what we're here doing is remembering, remembering things people. that happen. Yeah, right? people. Well, this was not necessarily about people, but it was. I can remember we would walk down to Essex from Upper Main Street to go shopping and things. And I was, remember one day when my mother and I and one of my sisters, probably my younger sister Kay, were coming down to the village. And Dick Tierney, who some of you may recall, had a farm just above where we lived at one, about 140 Main Street, that big old building, which is now the radio station. And he had a team of horses. Well, we were walking down just about across the church next to the cemetery, and all of a sudden, we realized that there was a runaway team of horses coming down Main Street, and it was Dick Kearney and his horses were, were coming down into the village. And we were rather panicky because we had the fence there with the cemetery, but of course we had the trees, some of them on the other side. And so for a moment, we were, I can remember, because things like that stick in your mind, 
we were sort of panic stricken there as those horses running by with Dick Tierney's team um, heading towards Five Corners. Now I can't recall what happened when they got to oh, Five no. Corners. You don't know if they crashed. No. Oh. Maybe he got control of them. But he sure didn't have control of them when he came by us. <laughs> so that's another story. What else do I want to say? I have one thing that has to do with a fair. A fair. A fair. Champlain Valley Fair, before it was down here, was where? It was up in Essex Center, out in the field. And my uncle lived in Cambridge, and he used to tell about coming down to the fair when it was up in Essex Center. And he was remarking about, his name was uh, Tobin, Henry Tobin. And he was remarking to me one day about he, how he had a dollar and he was coming down to the fair with some of his friends and he got on the train up to Cambridge, cost him 10 cents for a round trip ticket. And he came down to <coughs> Essex to go to the fair at the fairgrounds up there. He said they got off the train and they walked over to the fairgrounds and as they got into the fairgrounds, the first thing they came to was this guy. He was there, he had these beans, he was moving back and forth. You know, and people were trying to guess where the bean was. You've seen the trip. So he watched for a while and he said, he knew where that bean was. So I went up there and cost him a dime and he put, gave the guy a dime. Because he was going to find that bean and he picked it up. Of course, the bean wasn't there. And so he watched a little bit longer and he said, he knew exactly where that bean was. So he put down another dime and he says, picked it up. And of course, the bean wasn't there. He says, I get rid of the whole 90 cents playing with that bean. He says, I never did find it. Oh, no. He said, I think the guy tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story of the Essex Fair and Essex, when it was up, at the, up there. Now let's see, there was one other thing I was going to talk about. Well, I can't think of what it was, so it can't be important. That's all right. You can bomb back up later, Bob. Can bomb back up later. <laughs> uh, did anyone remember when we had minstrel shows? Yeah, yeah. Huh? talk about that. Remember the Mr. Show? Show? Yeah. You were talking about it? I was. I was asking if we could talk about Old Green Burnell, who was our, yeah. who was our neighbor. He used to put on some fantastic uh, yeah. Mr. Shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, up over where? Uh, they used to be up, up they in Lincoln Hall. They were Lincoln Hall for a while, and yeah. then they ended up at the high school, up at the, well, at that time it was the high school. I only yeah. remember them at Lincoln Hall. Yeah, no, they, at Fleming School. Fleming School? Yeah, the, the auditorium. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't remember those, but I remember when they used to have them up there. They were fantastic things to go to. They were so much. Yeah. yeah. The Lions Club got involved. Everybody in town got involved. Everybody got involved. And you had to dance, you had to sing. Mm -hmm. And he was the he was the um, the black face, of course. Mm -hmm. And because yeah. he he was an old vaudeville actor. Mm -hmm. And it also says in that book that he had acted in New York with a very famous um, magician. Magician. <laughs> by the name of Davis. Probably the guy with the, with the little uh, the nuts around. Right, yeah, <laughs> probably he was the one that came up and I don't know. But he knew how to sing, he was a great singer, he was, and he was a great actor. And um, who were the interlocutors? Something like the, it would have been Larry Yandel today. You know, well, well it might alive. have been Larry then too, I don't recall. No, no, it was no he would have been, we would have been pretty Had young. Rory. Had Rory, Had Rory, Rory would have been was one, one at one point, I yeah. don't recall, yeah. yeah. And he would be up there always keep, uh, telling jokes about people in town, great jokes, you know, the way they did. And then we'd have to get up. And I remember when my sister's and I, we had to sing, uh, Me and my shadow, <laughs> all alone and feeling blue. We had to learn how to tap dance, you know. And we'd go over to his house and we'd, he'd, he'd teach us. Teach us how Yeah, and he taught people to really to sing together. It was, well, it was a wonderful community. Well, they were. It was yeah. a community Time. event. And, everybody yeah. got and then, of course, Cakewalk, you know. Cakewalk was oh, big. Oh, jeez, yes. Yeah. Cakewalk was big at the university, and of course. I was there the year they realized, maybe this is the wisest idea. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Note. I actually am going to talk about three people. If that's okay, I'll be brief. And coincidentally... You um, need to probably step to the microphone so people can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, three different generations. This is my uh, husband's grandfather. His name is? Everett Reardon. Um, anybody remember him? He w went by Gramps or Grampy. And he was a huge fan of athletics. Here in Essex. 
So he went to a lot of different sporting events. Um, and my mother-in-law, Eileen Nelson, Eileen Reardon Nelson, uh, passed away about four or five years ago. And kind of sadly, more recently, um, <coughs> and you may have read about this in the paper, Dan Forsey. Yeah. And he graduated with me. From Wait, that's his high school? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What year was that? What year? I don't want to tell you. How old are you? 1970. You're just a child, don't worry about it. Always. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty much going to read this so I don't forget stuff. And I called it Ode to Those Past. The first person I'd like to talk about is my husband's grandfather, Reardon. He had quite a few names. His given name was Everett, but no one ever called him that. He usually answered to Robert or Bob. During his working years, he had the nickname Pinky, and nobody knows how he got that nickname. Um, after he had grandchildren, everyone called him Gramps or Grampy. He was a huge influence in his grandchildren's lives, loyally attending their athletic events, football, basketball, baseball. He had his own reserve seat in the dugout. Even the coaches called him Gramps. He was feisty and never apologized for his opinions, behaviors, or actions. An avid Yankee fan, he jumped out of his recliner to adjust the television and let out a huge fart. <laughs> Guess I got up too fast, he chuckled. <laughs> he married the love of his life, Alice Streeter of West Fulton. As time went by and her eyesight began to fail, he would read the favorite chocolate chip cookie recipe to her and helped measure ingredients as well, showing a much softer side to his, his, his demeanor. When Alice passed away unexpectedly, he immediately had a yard sale, sold the house, and moved to Florida. He never really liked Vermont's cold winters, but stayed because his beloved Alice wanted to be close to her family. He was close to 90 years old when he arrived there. Within a very short time after Alice had passed, he died from a fall, but I believe he died from a broken heart. My younger, sis my younger daughter, rather, Liza Alice, was born on his birthday, February 7th. Which is very... I don't believe in yeah. <laughs> coincidence. Yeah, nice. Eileen Reardon Nelson. Eileen was Gramps' daughter. She was a pragmatic woman, or as Jean once said, the most straight-ahead person I know. She was consummately devoted to her family. She raised five children in a small house with only one bathroom, making sure that each had only their allotted time to get ready for the day. In one-car family, she would drive Gordon to work, take each child to their destination, and then reverse the process at the end of the day. Oftentimes, she also drove to and from athletic team practices and extracurriculars. She opened her house to all her children's friends, and it wasn't unusual to find two or three extra bodies in the three boys' bedroom or feel the house vibrate as the basketball hit the hoop over the garage. I even watched the Super Bowl in her living room as Joan Namath led the Jets to victory. She was a strict disciplinarian, <coughs> but never unfair and never presumed that she would allow anyone else to critique her, her brood. She was bare protecting her cubs. Eileen had a great sense of humor and saw the levity in many situations and people, even herself. When Gordon was hospitalized for the last time, she noticed that he was growing increasingly pale. Maybe we should put some lipstick on him, she giggled, <laughs> trying to put the rest of us at ease. But for all that, she never got the punchline of a joke. She just sat there and stared blankly while the rest of us laughed. For all her good humor, however, her, her temper was legendary. Gordon once remarked that the roast that she had prepared tasted funny. She promptly stomped into the dining room, picked up the roast, and pitched it into the trash. And he didn't want to be anywhere near her house. Dear, her family forgot her birthday. She was just as wonderful a grandmother as a mother. She gladly let her grandchildren visit, read, babysit, 
If she had plans or was busy, she would let you know in short order. She loved being with her friends and spent many hours ice fishing on Lake Champlain. They would take their catch at the day's end and make a big pot of fish chowder. She was so good at fishing that she would take her excess perch and sell them to a local seafood house. One time she actually went through the ice. That did not stop her from going out on the ice again. She just took more precautions. Eileen loved playing bingo and went on gambling excursions to Vegas and Atlantic City. And she won more <coughs> often than she lost. We lost, I mean, four or five years ago due to failing health. She leaves a void which cannot be filled. My older daughter, Audrey, gave birth to a little girl on March 28th of this year, and her name is Emma Eileen. Dan Forsey. Dan Forsey passed away last month on August 12th. He was a friend and a fellow high school graduate. He was possibly the only person I know who could out-talk Billy Ward. Do any of you know Billy? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sparky um, was Dan. Um, according to my left-handed brother-in-law, they grew up in an era when teachers were compelled to correct lefties and turn them into righties. Well, Dan told the teacher in no uncertain terms that she couldn't make him do that and flatly refused. And he was at the time in second or third grade. <laughs> and he has kept voicing his opinion ever since. Dan was very athletic in high school, playing on Essex Junction's first football team. He was one of the fastest runners on the team. If he could get the ball to him, he would run like a bat out of hell. The only thing is, he never ran in a straight line. He always zigzagged on the field, and you could never tell where he was going. Um, it was like watching an eel on wheels. It was very exciting. 25 or 30 years ago, the Burlington Free Press printed an article about Dan. He was working construction at the time when Burlington was just beginning multiple story buildings, and this may have been the parking garage. Fearless as always, he was up in the air, stories above the street, prancing along steel beams like a cat on a balance beam. He was fearless. For a while, long periods of time would go by before I saw him. When I started to go into Burlington more frequently, I saw Dan more often. Over the past few years, he had let his hair and beard grow really long and bushy. He often wore a flannel shirt, which all in all gave him the appearance of a mountain man, albeit urban. <laughs> I would sometimes pass him on Riverside Avenue and noticed he had a pronounced limp. It made me sad to think that this once vibrant gridiron ace was hurt, but I don't think he felt sorry for himself. He loved to be outdoors, whether he was fishing or just stomping around in the woods. In recent years, he actually preferred living in a tent near the river rather than the confines of a structure and reporting to various agencies that would require this. Dan was a voracious reader and spent countless hours <coughs> at the Fr Fletcher Free Library devouring newspapers and forming opinions about everything under the sun. He was especially <coughs> into politics, local, state, national, probably the world. He would tell you exactly what he thought and didn't give a hoot if you agreed with him or not. He was passionate when he spoke gesticulating wildly, practically frothing at the mouth. He spoke about the deplorable decaying of Burlington's moral fiber. He was the vocal conscience of the Queen City. One of the things that Dan really enjoyed was just walking around the marketplace, engaging people's reactions to his intimidating appearance. <laughs> he would grin inwardly as they would cross the street rather than pass too close to him loving the fact that he knew they would be turning around to stare back at him. He would laugh wildly at your jokes, no matter how lame they might be. An infectious laugh, he made you feel witty, and Dan will be missed. Thank you so much. All right, how about Anne Gray? Anne serves on the Civil War Veterans Committee with me, and uh, 
Every time you need something done with history and Essex, this is the go-to lady. Well, I'm not going to talk about a Civil War person. No, okay, that's all right. <laughs> I want to talk about Marvin Campbell. Uh, Marvin and his wife uh, served on Essex Rescue for many, many years. Um, he, I understand this was before I knew Marvin, but when Essex Rescue was doing their super parties for fundraisers, I understand that Marvin probably sold most of the tickets. And then fast forward a few years and Essex Rescue stopped doing their <coughs> super parties and we got, we'd heard, by this time I was co-chairing the Memorial Day Parade, and we had heard that Marvin was getting bored. And so we needed somebody to do fundraising for us. So we asked Marvin if he would help us and he willingly volunteered. And he probably fundraised for us for maybe four or five years. But his job was, we had two categories of um, funds, of raising funds, and one of them was the sale of the banners, division banners in the parade. The cheapest division banner was a half a banner, which was $250. But we had this other category called many friends, and these were the people that could only afford to give five, 10, 15, 25 dollars. So that was Marvin's job, to raise money for the many friends. He would go put on his uniform, and he'd go door to door, he said nobody would refuse a little old man in an army uniform. <laughs> <laughs> he never raised less than $5,000. Wow. And there was probably only maybe five or six donations that were over $100. They were all five or 10 or $15. He would roll them like this and put a rubber band on them and put them in his pocket. <gasps> Kept meticulous records of who gave the money, but then he'd roll them all up. Well, have you ever tried to do a deposit? of dollar bills and checks that had been rolled with a rubber band on them for a couple of weeks. You almost had to have an ironing, an iron to iron them out. I think it was probably the last year that he did fundraising for us. There was a um, business down on Park Street that was, shall we say, a massage parlor? <laughs> shall we say. That turned out to be things other than a massage parlor. Well, Marvin went in there and <laughs> A few days before the police raided the place, and he managed to get $25 out of it. So that's my story about my <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Yay! Other story colors? Yeah. Okay, I've got a few library related tales. Uh, as I said, this is Mary Brownell's stories of her family, and her, her father was Sam Brownell, who's Photos over the the fireplace, and uh, you know, besides the man, the, he wasn't always an old man in oil painting. Uh, he he had uh, the house right across the street from where the library is because he gave the money, he gave the, the land that's where the library was, you know, to the village. And uh, but he he also ran a lumber mill down by the river, and he uh, he always said that um, you know he he tried to give something back to the village because. The village people uh, banded together in a bucket brigade and saved his lumber mill when it was on fire before the turn of the century. So this was, uh, this was village, village members saved his livelihood and he did a good job earning money, hence the Brownell block. And he had a, he had a, a, a pack of kids and, and a house and a lumber mill. So what did he do? He built a toboggan run out of the second floor of his house that the kids could go. Can you imagine kids running through the house with toboggans on the second floor. Anyway, this is how Mary De Brownell described this, this um, recreational <coughs> development at her house. We, we four had a toboggan shoot. Cleon was five, Winifred 15, Bl Blanche and I between. The platform was at the windowsill of Cleon's room in the upper floor. We could go in and out the window, but mostly we slid and then carried or dragged our toboggans up the cleated ramp. The chute had to be snowed and frozen, lumber for it came from father's mill, and the whole idea was his own. It must have been well built as no one ever hurt. We did ram a toboggan into Mr. Maycomber's picker, picket fence across the road. <laughs> we went right to his door and told him we were very sorry. He had a, a country store across the tracks. It was our Sunday school superintendent for 15 years, and his daughter Katie commuted by rail to the Boston Conservatory of Music. Uh, Mr. Brownell's uh, children um, wanted this library to be to be in the family. So when he established the library trustee board, he established five permanent trustee board members, probably originally so his family, his daughters, 
Miss Brownell and other daughters could be part of the board even though they lived in New York. Uh, some of them married rather wealthy men. And then, you know, the other five could be elected with, you know, the people of the village. Um, one of the first librarians here in Brownell was um, uh, Mary Metcalf. Uh, she um, ran the library, I believe, when it was above the, the village fire station where, uh, you know, the Kalantis block. And then she was responsible when it moved across to the Lincoln Hall um, conference room. Connie Stone and her sister Winona uh, visited the library. And, and Connie remembered it was dark and it was cold. And if you read the, um, the descriptions of uh, you know, how much money the library got, they, they, they had a problem paying their librarian one year because they just couldn't come up with the $25 for her pay. So um, the, the librarian after Mrs. Metcalf was her niece, uh, Winona Stone. And, I, and this, Miss Stone was a botanist and um, a, a, a very smart woman. I um, heard that she, um, she typed up, on, in her spare time, she wasn't paid anything to do this, she, she typed um, 30,000, 30,000 library cards on a manual typewriter so that the library would have a catalog. People that, people that knew her said that, you know, she was, she, she was a loving person, but she, she really expected the library to be quiet, quiet, quiet. And, you know, she, I think, um, she, she was very aware of the young families. Um, you had a young family, didn't you, Polly? And, and what did you tell me when you came in pushing your youngest? The, the first time I brought my, my oldest son, when he was probably five, into the library, she just looked at him and she said, oh, that must be Edward Whitcomb's son. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> because they looked like she him. Made, she made a summer reading program, uh, books for kids to keep logs in, with using up um, greeting cards that she'd saved all year long. And, and when I um, received the, the, I was fortunate enough to be hired in 1986 to, to this position and, you know, was getting to know the community. I, I kept hearing and hearing, you're nothing like when on the stone. I wasn't <laughs> sure whether that was good news or bad news. Um, but the, I, I never got to meet her. There are wonderful pictures of, of her um, here. Uh, when, when uh, she, she worked as the librarian for 22 years. When, her, when she retired, um, her sister Connie Stone uh, had that beautiful hanging that's um, hooked, that took a year and a half to make by Mrs. Lettieri down in West, with Westminster, uh, Westminster West, um, who came, one of my first programs I, I came up with was having her come up and talk about the making of that uh, of that hanging. If you look at it closely, since she loved children's materials and she loved flowers, the, the flowers aren't just some random posy. They're specific flowers that she liked, foxgloves and particular flowers. And if you look carefully, you'll notice there are children's characters from uh, Tom, you know, from uh, I think there's Toad of Toad Hall, and there is um, Arietti and. Uh, a variety of there's a knight charging. Oh, Mary Poppins coming out, so don't miss that. I didn't get to meet Winona, but I did, I did get to know Connie Stone. Connie was uh, in her maybe early 80s when I joined the, the club here, and uh, she, she, was, um, she was very willing to do anything I suggested, and one thing I would, I, I, people still give us wonderful books, and they, they started doing that very soon after I came, and she would check to make sure that the books weren't a something. I'd pick out a few that I thought we'd like, and she would check the catalog to see if they were ones we had, and she'd check the fiction or nonfiction catalog to see if they were important. And one day, um, one day, I had, I had weeded through, as I do every year, weeded through all the nonfiction, and I came to this older looking title called In Search of England, and uh, she noticed that I weeded it out. And um, she goes, I, I, I never do this, she goes, but I really feel you should reconsider this book because it's written by H.V. Morton, and H.V. Morton wrote the best travel. Um, and I said, okay, Miss Stone, I'll take it home and I'll read it. And how right she was, it's still in the collection, he writes the best. And he, though it was before World War II, it really pulls together what was going on in England. So I, I took her word for it. Now, I've, I've met, since she's passed away, I've met her, her niece, and Connie, before she came 
she was back here as a volunteer for me. She worked as a librarian in Baghdad. She knew Arabic. She um, worked in the Philippines during the war. I think she worked. And her, her nieces still to this day think that maybe she was a spy. They don't know for sure, but they think she might be because she knew a lot. She would absolutely call about Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. She just thought it was unconscionable. And uh, the last time I saw her, I brought her uh, a, a book called uh, Galileo's Daughter, and she was at the Converse home in Burlington. And um, and she, uh, you know, she wanted to hear all about the library. And I said, "So do you get out with that much?" She goes, "Oh no, I do. Ex I don't want to cause trouble. I do exactly as they tell me." So um, I'm, I'm so glad to remember her and, and enjoy, enjoy thinking about what, she, what she'd think of having a room where we could have meetings like this. And I, I, I bet Mr. Brownell is smiling down on us, too, because I think he would be pleased that we could tell stories of him and his, his library and his village. So, and, and, and Mr. Yendo, yes. I think my, Connie Stone was my mother's probably one of her very, very best friends. And um, I remember once she came back, I believe it was from West Africa, when she was in Ghana. <clears throat> and she brought this figure, this doll back, round head like this, with a straight body and a belly button. And she had great, she told all kinds of great stories. She said, oh. I don't know if this is a fertility doll, but if that's important to you, keep rubbing that belly button. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Oh, yes, yeah. she, she really um, was a world traveler and cared terribly about about, she wasn't about to just assume, uh, agree with everybody. She had to read it for herself, figure it out, and she was appalled by Americans' ignorance of um, the Middle East. Yeah. She felt that the uh, Middle East was sadly un misunderstood and the culture wasn't understood. And uh, I, think, I think she'd be ho rather horrified by some of the things that has go have gone on in the last decade. And she'd be excited about the Arab Spring. So are there any further, has this discussion brought to mind any stories that should be told before the evening's over. Any, anybody, anybody else don't want to tell a story? Yes, want to stand up and come, come up? Well, I can talk oh, from here because I, I talk loud. Uh, I was reminded when I read the, the uh, article in the reporter about this, and uh, I, I was reminded of uh, Will Wool. And some of you must know him. And uh, he had a wealth of stories, and I, I'll relate one of them uh, to you uh, concerning this couple that had one son who was drafted into the army uh, during the war. And the father, he had poor eyesight, and so that when he wrote letters home, his wife would read read them to him, and uh, in one one letter he was feeling kind of sad about everything, and he was telling about all the things that he missed about home. And he says, "You know, Mom," he says, "I even miss that little pot we used to put under the bed at night." <laughs> <laughs> and the father says, "Hmm, he used to miss it even when he was home." <laughs> <laughs> what's your name, please? Yeah, let's give, what's... My name is John Keane. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I knew right. The um, only other thing, when I was hired by the, the Board of Trustees at Brown Library, and, and Harold Meeks was the chair of the board at that time, and uh, he he um, was, he, he was kind of excited to have a, a new librarian, and, and yet sometimes she'd do things that he was stunned by, and and they had always been a, a, a shelf of books behind the desk that were had pictures in them that maybe had naked bosoms or there was just and I I just didn't believe in that I just took them all off the shelf and put them where everybody could read them and 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 he turned to me once he said do you think that people need to read about that in the library what uh, can't they just learn it on the streets like I did <laughs> <laughs> Dear Harold, he, he, he would have enjoyed this evening as well. If, if there are no further stories, I um, I guess I I I get to choose. And I ah, boy, this is tough. I think I think I like the the Revenger story. So you can have Mary Brownell's. You're kidding. Mary Brownell's. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Yes. Um, and if, if you come to think, you think there's many more people that should have been here tonight, who knows, maybe we can do a, a Larry Yandow Jr. evening, evening too, um, if we find out who they are, because it's, it's a lot of fun to, to have these tales on, on CD. So um, again, I, call for I know, I know, where are they? Well, that's the people you should yeah. chastise them, gather them together. So thank yourselves.